Hi, it's Mark from Ripple Training. I've been using, writing about, and teaching Apple Motion since it first came out back in 2005. I really think of it as the most useful plugin that you can have for Final Cut Pro. In this video, I'm going to show you how easy it is to use Motion to create useful tools, motion graphics, and visual effects for Final Cut Pro. If you're brand new to Motion, immediately after watching this video, you're going to be able to put it to use. And if you have some experience with motion, I think you'll pick up some useful tips and maybe make some discoveries along the way. Before we get started, please subscribe, click the bell, click the like button. You can always unlike it later, but I think you're going to enjoy this. Let's get started. Okay, our first motion project is both incredibly simple to make and super useful in Final Cut Pro. When you launch motion, you're presented with this project browser. By default, we see five different blank motion project types that you can select from. The first is this generic motion project, and the other four are projects specifically designed to be used in Final Cut Pro. We're going to select the Final Cut Title Project. The preset doesn't really matter, but I'll just use this 4K Ultra HD preset. And the frame rate really doesn't matter either, but I'll choose 60 frames per second. And I'll leave it at the default 10 second duration, which also doesn't really matter and I'll click Open, and we get a new untitled project. The Layers list is selected by default. The Layers list includes a list of all the layers in the project. In this case, it includes a title background, which is where the video will appear, and a text layer. I'm going to delete the text layer because we don't need it. I'll select it and hit the Delete key. We're done. Our first project is ready to go. Under the File menu, I'll choose Save, and notice, because it's a Final Cut title project, we get a dialog in order to save it for accessing it in Final Cut Pro. I'll give it a name. I'll call it Adjustment Layer. I'll create a brand new category for it. And I'll call this uh, Magic Motion. And optionally, you can assign a theme. I'm not going to do that here. I'm also not going to include unused media or save a preview movie. You almost never need to do that and then I'll click Publish. That's literally all you have to do for this first project. Now, let's look at how useful this adjustment layer title effect is in Final Cut Pro. So here in Final Cut Pro, I'm going to go to the Titles and Generators sidebar, and under Titles, there's our new category. It appears at the top because I added a space before the name Magic Motion. If I select it, there's our new title adjustment layer. And you'll see why I used a title project to do this rather than an effect. The whole purpose of an adjustment layer is that it allows you to add transformations and effects to multiple clips at the same time. I'm going to start with these several clips at the start of this project. So with this adjustment layer selected, I'll press Q for Connect Edit, and then I will extend it to cover all those clips. So. The first thing we can do is we can add a color correction that will affect all the clips underneath it. Because the active clip indicator is over the adjustment layer, we don't even need to select it. We can just go directly to the color inspector and make an adjustment. And I'll do something obvious like reduce the saturation. And you can see we now have a black and white version of this first clip. But because we applied this color board effect to the adjustment layer instead of the clip itself, it's applied to all the clips that are underneath it. So it's a super efficient way to apply the same color correction to multiple clips at the same time. And because it's a title, first of all, you can see that there is an effect applied because you can see the title as an opposed to an effect that's applied on a clip. The only way to see it is to select the clip and then go to the video inspector and see if there's a list of effects there. But not only that, you can toggle it on and off by tapping the V key, V for visibility, and you can trim it so that it affects more or fewer clips. And you can move it to decide exactly which clips you want to affect. And you can even duplicate it. So I'll just say we want it on these two clips, but not this one here. I'll hold down the Option key and drag a copy of it over here. And now we can have it affect just the clips that we want it to. Now, while color correction is the most common usage for an adjustment layer, you can do other things as well. I'm going to move to this next set of clips. I'm going to tap an I at the start of them and O at the end, and then press Q, which will give me a connect edit that covers 
all those clips precisely. And let's say for this set of clips, I'd like the side to slide open to make room for a title. So I can apply transformations to multiple clips at once by using the adjustment layer. For instance, if I go up to the video inspector with this adjustment layer selected or just with the active clip indicator over it, and I adjust rotation, it will rotate all the clips that are underneath it. Or if I adjust scale, it will scale all the clips underneath it. What I'm going to do here is set a couple keyframes. I'll set a keyframe for position right at the beginning, and then I'll move forward a little bit, and I'll drag over an X just to make a little room. Let's say I want to have a little title slide in there, and then I want it to stay there all the way until this clip. I'll set another keyframe, and then go to the end. I'll press the down arrow and the back arrow to get on that last frame there, and then I'll reset X to zero. And now what will happen is the first clip will slide over to reveal anything I want to put there. And then we retain that for all the clips underneath the adjustment layer until the end where it slides back. And I can also adjust those keyframes by pressing Control V to view the keyframes. Under the transform properties, I'll select position. And then if you right click on the keyframe, you can choose whether it's smooth or linear. Now, I prefer to have that smooth the way it is, but you could switch it to linear for kind of a more sudden stop or switch it back to smooth where the movement slows down to a stop. So any transformations in position, rotation, or scale can be applied to adjustment layer to affect all the clips underneath. You can also use adjustment layers to add LUTs or lookup tables to multiple clips at once. Now, of course, you can always select multiple clips and apply a lookup table, but the adjustment layer is more flexible. So I'll deselect those, move the playhead to the beginning of this range of clips. I'll press I, hit the down arrow a couple times, O, Q, and because my adjustment layer is selected, it gets applied, and it hasn't done anything yet. So you can see those clips look all a little washed out because they're all shot in log. Then from the color category of the effects browser, I'll add the custom lot effect. and I'll add one of the custom LUTs that I have installed. I really like these phantom LUTs for this footage shot with the Sony a7S III. And by selecting a single LUT, I've now applied it to all three of those clips, and then I can grade from there. If I wanna change it, I just need to change it for this one adjustment layer instead of for all the clips underneath. Another great use for an adjustment layer is tone mapping. So here I have a series of clips shot with an iPhone 13 in HDR, but I'm working in a standard library or a Rec. 709 library. So I want to tone map these to Rec. 709. And once again, rather than applying the effect to all these clips, I'll use an adjustment layer. I, function right arrow to go to the end, O, Q. In the effects browser, in the color category, I'll add the HDR tools effect. Then in the Video Inspector, I'll choose HLG to Rec. 709 for the mode for the HDR Tools effect. And that will immediately map all of those clips at once to Rec. 709. And then I can grade further if I desire, but I already have a great starting point. Finally, adjustment layers are great for making flexible, movable chapter markers. So here I have a very long project that's about 17, 18 minutes, and I've got a couple chapter markers. And in my timeline index, I have chapter markers selected and I can jump back and forth between them. Now, normally chapter markers, like any marker, are not movable. You can't drag them around. Well, I should say you can use a keyboard shortcut to nudge them, but you can't move them very far. I've added an adjustment layer here and you can make them very small. And I've put the marker on the adjustment layer. That way I can easily move this marker anywhere I want or copy paste it somewhere and it just makes chapter markers much more flexible and much more easy to use. And of course, it also works for ordinary markers and to-do markers. So you might think it's kind of weird that we're using a motion graphics application to make a title that does nothing, but it turned out to be super useful in Final Cut Pro, and it's incredibly simple to make. Okay, I think our second project is even cooler, and it's almost as easy as the one we just did. 
Now I pressed Command N for a new motion project. You'll notice that I left the old one open and I'm just doing that to demonstrate that you can have multiple motion projects open at the same time, which can be useful. But I'll go ahead and close this one. And then in the project browser this time, I'm gonna choose a Final Cut effect. I know I just told you that titles are the most useful types of Final Cut effects to use, but in this case, we need to use a Final Cut effect for what we're gonna do in Final Cut Pro. Once again, the preset really doesn't matter in terms of the resolution and the frame rate really doesn't matter, nor does the duration. So all I need to do is choose Final Cut Effect and click Open. And once again, we get a new untitled project. This time, however, because it's an effect, there's no title in the layers list and just something called the effect source, which much like the title project is the placeholder for where the video will go. So anything that you do to this will be applied to the video in Final Cut Pro. In our case, we're not gonna do anything. However, I wanna take this idea of publishing one step further. In our first lesson, we published the motion project to Final Cut Pro. We're gonna do the same thing here, but we're also gonna publish some parameters, which is the other really powerful thing about motion. So I'm gonna to go to the Inspector tab here, and then in the Inspector tab, we have four tabs of its own, and I'm gonna select the first one, the Properties tab. This tab, looks very much like the video inspector in Final Cut Pro. It has all these transform properties, blending properties. It's very, very similar. In this case, I want to have access to the position, rotation, and scale parameters in Final Cut Pro. So I want to publish them. To do that, I want to click this downward facing arrow that appears when we move the cursor over it, and then I'll choose Publish. I'll do the same thing for rotation, and the same thing for scale. Now to see what I've done, I go back to this layers list and select the project. Then in this inspector, I also select project. This first tab of project is called publishing. We can see it's highlighted. So this shows us our published parameters, position, rotation, and scale. The three parameters I just published show up here. And you can publish just about anything in motion. You can publish the color of a shape, or the speed of emitted objects, or the shape of a replicator. It goes very deep, and we'll look at more of that in a bit. But we're done with this. We've created everything we need to do to create this very cool effect in Final Cut. So once again, I'm gonna press Command S, and I'm gonna name this Object Remover. I'll save it to a new category. And the reason we don't see the category we created before is this time it's an effect. So it'll be saved to the effects browser. So we need a new one there. So I'll do space motion magic, click create. Once again, I don't need a theme and I don't need to click either of these checkboxes. I'll just click publish. Remember, all we did is open a new effect project and we published three parameters. That's it. Let's go to Final Cut Pro. So here in Final Cut Pro, I'll go to the effects browser and there's my new category. Uh, space and then motion magic and there's our object remover effect. Now what I want to do is take advantage of the new object tracker feature that was introduced in Final Cut Pro 10.6. You can use the object tracker to track titles and effects. When you use it to track effects you can use a mask because all effects have masks built into them. Normally, you would do this with a color correction, but we're gonna take advantage of that functionality to do the same thing with our little effect here. So I'm gonna drag this effect onto the clip, and you can see in the video inspector, here are our three published parameters that we published in motion, position, rotation, and scale. For instance, if I drag in position, it will move the whole clip. And you might say, well, so what? You could do that with the transform down here. And that's true. However, here's where we're going with this. Because this object remover is an effect, it has a mask. So I'm gonna add a shape mask. And then I'll select the tracker and drag the tracker over this object and track it. I'll click Analyze. Now that it's tracked, I'm gonna to switch to the shape and I'm gonna adjust this shape to better fit the object. And I'll also reduce the feather amount. 
now that I've done that, I've restricted my parameters or this effect to just the mask. So now if I drag in position X, I'm dragging just that object over, leaving the clip underneath to appear. And that way I can replace these current pixels with nearby pixels and essentially remove that object. If I now click on the icon for the mask itself, so it no longer shows the on-screen control, and I play that clip back, we've completely removed that paraseller from the scene. And let me just uncheck that object mover to bring him back, and you can see where he's there and where he's gone. So you can see where you can use this kind of thing in many instances, and usually it's smaller items that will work better when you want to remove them from a scene, but it could be a dead pixel or somebody in the shot you don't want. Uh, but it's an amazing way to increase the functionality of the object tractor in Fonica Pro by publishing a dead simple effect from motion with three published parameters. All I did was adjust position here, but because I published rotation and scale, they'd be available for other types of situations where you might need them. So I hope you're starting to see that motion is kind of a Swiss army knife. In addition to creating beautiful titles and transitions and interesting animations, you can use it to do very useful things for editing. And this is another example. So I've started a new title project. And once again, I'll delete the text because we're not going to use it for a title. And then in the library over on the left, there are a bunch of built-in 3D objects. So the point here, I'll go to icon view, is that motion supports 3D objects in the USDZ format. And Final Cut does as well, but the only way to get 3D objects into Final Cut Pro is through motion. And you can use these built-in 3D objects. If you click on one, you get a little preview of it and it kind of spins it around. But you're not restricted to these 60 items. Any 3D object in the USDZ format could be imported into motion. And there's a ton of free content out there and you can buy 3D objects as well. I have a full tutorial dedicated to working with 3D objects in motion, but this here is about how you can quickly get that object into Final Cut Pro and use it effectively. So rather than use one of the built-in ones, I'm gonna press Command-I to import and I have a few different objects here, many of which I got on sketchfab.com. For instance, here's this hover bike and you see it has a little animation built in. And here's a little sea turtle. Some 3D objects are animated, some are not. And then I'm gonna use this little biplane. And I'm hitting the space bar, by the way, because you can open any 3D USDZ file with Quick Look. So I'll choose Import. It's pretty small by default. So what I'm gonna do, I'll introduce another aspect of Motion's interface. We're gonna go to the inspector. It's much like the inspector in Final Cut Pro where you've got different tabs to do different things. In the properties tab, we've already seen, we've got those same type of things you'll find in the video inspector. But there's also a tab that's specific to the type of object that you're working with. So for this 3D object, I'm gonna change the unit size from automatic to original and see if it looks better. It actually looks worse there. So then I'll go to custom and I'm just gonna to try to play with the size a little bit so it's a little more appropriate for what we need to fill the screen a little more. And then I'm gonna use this green arrow, which is the Y axis, just to pull it down. You can also rotate it here to look at it, rotate it in different axes, but I'm not gonna do any of that. I'm hitting Command Z to undo. But once again, I do wanna publish these parameters so they can be accessed in Final Cut Pro. Maybe I'll rotate it on this axis so we can see the side of it. I'll undo that. If I hold the shift key down and drag, it'll rotate in 45 degree increments. So now it's exactly sideways and I'll center it something like that. Then I'll go back to that properties tab and just like we did for the object remover, I'll publish position, rotation, and scale. So we can access those parameters and even keyframe them in Final Cut Pro. Command is to save. I'll call it 3D biplane. We've already got our category set up. I'll click publish. And one more thing. Notice this area here. This is called the mini timeline. 
and it shows the selected object. So if I select title background, it'll show title background. But if I select the biplane, it stops. If I were to press play, we'd see it there and it just disappears. And you can also see it here in the full timeline. That's because this is a looping animation and it's only this long. But because it's a looping animation, we can extend it. You can either drag the end of it to extend it out, or a faster thing to do, I'll press Command Z to undo that, is I'm just gonna move the player to the end of our project here and tap O for an out point. And these little segments here indicate where it loops. You'll notice it's one second long, and this project is 10 seconds long, so it should loop perfectly. I'll save once again, and now let's go to Final Cut Pro. So here we are in Final Cut Pro. I'm in the Titles and Generators sidebar in Titles, and I'm in the Magic Motion category that we created, and there's our brand new 3D biplane, which we can skim over and see it animate. I could just add it directly to a project, but let's track something here. I've got this young woman running along the beach, so I will drag this biplane over and track her. And I'll click Analyze. I'll then trim this title with option right bracket so it ends at the same point of this clip. And now this plane moves along and tracks with her. Now you might wonder like, oh, I see we've published position, rotation, and scale, but couldn't you just go to the video inspector and adjust those? And the answer is you could, but you need to be a little bit careful. For instance, if we go to the transform here, you can see here is the bounding box of that plane. And if we were to make that bounding box smaller, either by dragging an edge or by dragging in the scale parameter, it reduces the size of the plane, but it also reduces that bounding box. And that can get in the way when we go to work with our published parameters. For instance, if I now use position, we can go outside that bounding box. So what I prefer to do, I'm gonna undo those until it's large again, is I'm gonna scale it down so it stays within that bounding box and then I'll move it over and up a little bit. And I can't move it any further than that. So now what I might do is go back to the video inspector and position the whole frame back a little bit, just so we have it following her onto the screen. So as I scrub through, it follows her along. Now, because we've published these parameters, we can do more than that. So I'll go back to my title inspector for my published parameters. And at this point, I'm going to set some keyframes. I'll set keyframes for position, rotation, and scale. And I'm just going to play with this. I'll move forward a little more in time. And let's say, even though it's tracking her, now I want it to kind of turn and move away from her. So I'll open rotation and rotate it on the y-axis to start to point towards us. And I'll also move it in X so it's moving forward. And maybe let's say we want to have it dip down first. So now if I scrub through, it follows along with her, but then dips down. And then let's have it by this point have moved across further and rotated more towards us. And let's also rotate it on X so it's pointing up more and then move it up, perhaps all the way off the screen. And maybe I'll move it over a little bit more before we get all the way off the screen up to about there, and then off the screen. So by setting those keyframes, let's now play that back. It follows her at first, but then dips down, turns, and flies up off the screen. And we take full advantage of the fact that it's a 3D object, so we can rotate it in 3D space and see different aspects of that 3D object. So motion is the way that you get 3D objects into Final Cut Pro. So all you need to do is import them into motion, into a title project is what I prefer to do, publish a couple parameters, and go to town in Final Cut Pro. Okay, now we're gonna take your motion knowledge a little deeper by modifying an existing title to match corporate logo colors, something that people often need to do. The thing to understand is that in Final Cut, almost all of the titles, transitions, generators, and effects were created in motion and can be modified in motion. For example, here I'm in this particular category of bumper opener for titles, and there are many in here, but I'm just gonna pick one here. 
this one called endpage in the kinetic theme. So if I skim over it, we've got this one called endpage. And let's say I like that, but I want to make some changes to it. Well, first, let's see what's possible in Final Cut. I'll select it and press W for an insert edit and just play through it. Like, okay, that's pretty cool. And wait, does it have transparency? What if I put it over here and put it at the beginning of this? Yes, it has transparency. It comes in and then covers that up and then fades out. Okay, great. But, you know, I'm not totally thrilled about the colors, but what can I change? Well, if we go to the title inspector, we can see the published parameters. In this case, we don't see things like position, rotation, and scale. We have two pop-up menus. And these are something called widgets, which we'll get into a little bit later. So there's one for a shape and one for a color theme. So rather than the box, we could change that to a leaf. And now we have this whole animation with this leaf shape. Or we could choose a triangle. And once again, we have a whole animation, both a different shape. Then you can also choose one of four different color themes, hot, warm, or cold, in addition to the default cool. So for instance, if I do hot, now we have a different shape and a different color theme. So a lot of flexibility, but let's say none of that's quite what we want. Let's say we, we really like the leaf, uh, but we don't really like these color themes. I'll go back to the default. So what I'm gonna do is, because this was created in motion, if I right click on it, I can choose open a copy in motion. So let's do that. And it immediately opens in motion and we can play the project and we see the same animation. Opening existing titles, transitions, effects, and generators from Final Cut Pro into motion is a great way to start to learn how these are constructed so you can build your own projects. We can see here in the layers list, there are two top level groups, one for the drop zone, which is the underlying video in Final Cut Pro, and one called comp for the composition. If we open that up, we can see there are a bunch of groups inside it. And each of those contain a bunch of elements, primarily a bunch of shape elements. And each of those have, for instance, some masks on them. And then there's a group with text in it. So you can start to sort of look at things and understand how it's constructed, but we don't need to change anything here. What we're gonna do if we select the project and we go to the inspector to the publishing tab, we see those same published parameters that we've seen in the last few projects. And again, these pop-out menus are something called widgets where they each have multiple parameters rigged to them. And the way you access the details is to look in the rig right here. So if I open up the rig, we can see that same color and shape pop-up menus. Let's start with color. So here with this color widget selected, we can see the same pop-up menu up top. And these are the states or the snapshots for each of these parameters that are rigged to it. It's a lot of terminology, but all it means is the colors of each of these shapes will change depending on which state is selected because those colors have been rigged to this widget. So what we want to do is add a new state or a new snapshot. To do that, all you need to do is click the plus button and give it a name. And I'll just call it my colors. Now all we need to do is change these colors. And notice how the same color is used in multiple places here. Well, we can do the same thing. For instance, white is used here, 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 and here. So instead of white, let's change this to a different color. And I'll just do something more in the kind of light purple. And I'm going to take that color swatch and drag it onto each instance that was white to make it purple. I'll do the same thing with this light yellow. Maybe I'll make that a little bit darker. And I'll drag that onto each yellow swatch. And then finally, we have this orange. And I'll just choose a lighter color here and drag that onto each orange instance. Now, if I play the project, we have my new color theme with the exact same basic structure as the other ones. 
You're not forced to do that. You can do anything you want, but this way we're consistent with the overall look where the same objects have the same color. And that's all you really need to do. I'm going to take this one step further, however. You notice in the timeline down here, we have these markers. This marker here is called the poster frame, which is the thumbnail that will show up in Final Cut Pro. These markers are build-in and build-out markers, and they determine the area that gets stretched or squished in Final Cut Pro when you trim the title. So because this build-in marker is placed here, all of this animation beforehand will not change its timing when you trim the title in Final Cut Pro. If you make the title longer, this animation will still take the exact same amount of time to animate on, four seconds and seven frames. The same thing with the outgoing animation. It will still last exactly this long and it won't change. The only thing it will change is this in-between area that will get stretched or trimmed and nothing's happening there. So these markers are a way of forcing your animation to match what you originally designed. The only thing I don't like about them is right now they're mandatory. So I'm going to double click on each one and change them to build in optional and build out optional. By doing that, if we go back to our project and look at our published parameters, we've now published those markers essentially so that we can turn off those animations if we don't want them. That's it. I'm going to press Command S to save. Actually, before I do, let's change the shape. Let's say we want the default shape for our new color theme to be this leaf. That's what we want to use. So I'll select that. I'll press Command S to save. And let's go back to Final Cut. Back in Final Cut, we immediately see that our end page copy has our new color theme and our new shape applied. So let's delete the current version. I'm going to extend this clip a little bit here. And then I'll add our new version with Q and play it. And it defaults to our new color theme with our shape because that's the state that we saved it in. And now because we have these build in and build out parameters set as optional, if we didn't want this fade out at the end, let's make this last exactly as long as this clip. Instead of fading out at the end, I could turn off that build out animation and it just stays solid and we cut to the next clip. Now you can take this much further. For instance, we didn't change the color of the text. Of course, you can always change that here directly in Final Cut, but let's have it change automatically in motion. So what I'll do is right click and choose open in motion. And notice that for color, the text is not included here, but we can add it easily. So I'll open up this comp group. I'll open the text group and select the text. Then under the appearance tab, we see the face color. Well, I'll use this pop-up menu right here. And instead of publishing it, which is certainly an option, you could just publish it directly to change it, but I'm going to add it to a rig and the rig I'm going to add it to is the color rig. Now that I've done that, if I select the color rig, we can see the text color is added right here. So for our particular state, we don't want gray. It kind of makes it disappear. So I'll make it white. Notice if I go back to any of the other ones, it remains gray. It's only changed for my particular snapshot. Command S to save. Go back to Final Cut. Let's do a replace from Start Edit. And now our default state is to have the white text. So even before you've learned how to do a lot of this yourself in Motion, you can go ahead and modify existing titles built into Final Cut Pro to fit your needs. Okay, so let's create our own animated title from scratch. It's going to be a simple title, but we'll use it to introduce important motion features that you can use for more complex projects. So I've already created a brand new motion title project. You can tell it's a title project because of the title background and the text object. If I select the project itself and I go to the properties, we can see that is a 4K UHD project, 3840 by 2160 at 59.94 frames per second. 
it really doesn't matter too much what the setting is, much like the other ones we've done so far, because everything we do in here will be scalable to any resolution because we'll be using vector objects. So primarily, I wanna focus on what you can do with type. Motion is very powerful when it comes to working with type. Let's make a few changes to this text layer. I'll select in the layers list. I'll go to the text tab of the inspector where I can increase the font size. I can change the font. I can change the alignment. And if I go to the layout pane, you'll see this is set to a paragraph. So if I double click right in the viewer, I can adjust the spacing of these margins. And I'll just make it big like that. And then press the escape key. In addition to this format pane and the layout, there's an appearance tab where you can change the face color, add an outline, add a glow, add a drop shadow, and even work with 3D text, which is beyond the scope of what we're doing right here. But the 3D text in motion is phenomenal. All I want to do here is create a simple animation on this text. When you animate in motion, you can use traditional keyframes and a keyframe editor, and it's very powerful, but you need to know about behaviors. So I'll take you over to the library here where all of motion's content is. And you can see we've got behaviors, filters, generators, particle emitters, just a ton of stuff. I'm gonna focus on behaviors, which are ways of animating things without keyframes. And you can use behaviors to animate many different types of objects in motion. For instance, audio, cameras, particles, replicators, shapes, and of course, text. And in fact, if you look at text, we have this text animation category, but we have another one called text sequence, which includes folders of a variety of different ways of animating text. And the basic idea is that you take one of these and simply drag them onto the text and you create animation. So there it blurs in. And each one of these, if you go to the inspector, has many controls for adjusting how it works. A lot of this you can figure out on your own. What I wanna show you is that all of these text sequence behaviors in here, of which there are many dozens, if not hundreds, were created with a single behavior. So I'm gonna delete this existing one. I'm gonna to go to the text animation category and I wanna use this sequence text behavior. When I place it on the text, you see it lasts for the whole duration of the project and nothing happens by default. This is kind of the template that's used by all of those other text sequence behaviors. And one way that's useful to work with it is simply to make changes directly in the viewer. Before I do anything, I'm gonna move the play forward a little bit and tap O to trim this behavior so it only lasts for this length of time, a little over about a second and a half. And then I'm gonna set a new play range out point so that when we play, we'll just loop this little range here instead of playing the whole project. Now, for example, if I drag up on this text and then play, the text will drop back into position. I'll undo that. If I drag on the red handle to the left, drag it off the screen and play back, the text will fly in from the left. I'll undo that. If I drag on the blue handle, the blue axis that's pointing right at us, this is the Z axis, and play that back, the text will now fly in from close to the camera. I'll undo that. You can also rotate the text and it will rotate into position. So I'll drag this up and I'll rotate it a little bit and the text drops down into place. Now, if we go to the inspector, we can make some changes. And one of the things that I love about motion is this real-time interactive playback where you can adjust your animation while it's playing. So you see here, we have the behaviors tab selected automatically in the inspector. We have the sequence text behavior here and a lot of parameters to adjust. You can see position and rotation are here already because we manipulated them directly in the viewer but I can add another one. I'm gonna add format opacity, and I'll take that opacity down to zero so that each letter now fades on as it drops in. 
Another useful parameter is the spread. Right now, each letter is coming in pretty much one at a time, but if I increase the spread, we get a smoother animation because it's being spread over more letters at once. I'll pull that back down a little bit. I can also change the direction to backwards or center to ends, or I really like random. So these letters fade in and drop down in a random way. If I don't like that random uh, type, I can click on the random seed and change the randomness. I can also adjust the speed to ease both so we get a nice smooth landing to the text. So I just want to get you excited about the possibilities of animating text yourself instead of just dropping a preset on it. You can get really creative with text animation. For the thing that we're going to build today, I'm going to use a very simple text animation. So I'm actually going to delete this sequence text behavior. And this time I'm going to use the behavior pop-up menu and choose text animation, type on. And once again, I'll trim this to about here. I'll just tap O and we get a simple type on effect because what I want to do is create a little uh, message bubble, like a text message where you see the text type on. To create the text bubble, we'll use a couple of shapes. I'll move the playhead back to the start of the project and I'm also going to create a new group to contain this. So I'll select this current group and then I'll choose Object, New Group to create a new group. And because it's selected, anything I make will appear inside it. Now I'm going to use this shape tool right here for a rectangle and just draw a simple rectangle shape. I'll press Escape to get out of that tool. And then in the inspector, I'll change its fill color to a blue color. I'll also go to the Geometry tab and increase its roundness. Now our little bubble needs a tail here. For the tail, I'm going to draw it manually by using the Bezier tool. So I'm going to click drag to make a few points. Then I'll select this point, hold down the Option key in order to break these Bezier handles to make more of a curve. Then I'll move the little tail below the rectangle. And I want it to have the same color exactly as the rectangle, so I'll select the rectangle, go to the style, and then I'm going to take this fill color and just drag it right on top of my second shape so that the color matches exactly. If I wanted to modify this, I could hold down Option and Command to zoom in closer, right click on it and choose Edit Points, and manipulate it to maybe make it look a little bit better. Shift S will get me back to my normal selection tool and Shift Z will fit to the window. And let's name this group Message Bubble. And then I want to move it below our text. So let's create a new group. And this time I'll use a keyboard shortcut, Shift Command N, and I'll drag our text above. And if I move a play it forward, there we see our text. Let's save before we do anything else. We'll call it My Message Bubble. We'll put it in the Magic Motion category and click Publish. Now, we want this bubble obviously to fit with the text. And there's a couple things we can do. First of all, when you move the text, you'd like the message bubble to move with it. So I'm going to select the group containing both of those shapes. I can even close it here. And then I'm going to go to the Behaviors pop-up menu, and I'm going to choose Basic Motion Align To. And in the inspector, I get a little well asking, well, what do you want me to align to? Well, I want you to align to the text. So I'll drop that in there and it aligns to the text. It's not exactly centered. It actually is exactly centered for the bounding box of these two shapes, but it's slightly off if we want the text to be centered in the bubble itself. So what we can do is use the little offset control here just to shift it down a bit. Now, if I select the text and I move the text around, that bubble will always move with it. I'll undo that. But if we were to add more text or reduce the amount of text in there. For instance, let's go back to the Text Inspector to the Format tab and add some more text. Here is some more. It doesn't change. We want this to automatically change its size every time we adjust the text size or the amount of text so that it always fits perfectly. 
And we're going to use a very cool filter in Motion called the Sliced Scale Filter. Back in the library, just as we had behaviors, we also have filters. And I have some third-party filters here as well, but Motion comes with a ton of filters built in. If I go to the Distortion category, towards the bottom, there's one called Sliced Scale. I want to apply it to this message bubble group. I can drag it on from here, or I can use the shortcut menu up here for filters by going to Distortion, Sliced Scale. Here's why I'm using this. If I weren't to use it, let me turn it off for a minute, and I were to scale this bubble to fit the text, I'll hold the Option key down to scale in both directions at once. Notice how the tail is also scaling, so it looks terrible, right? In fact, the corners where it's rounded are also scaling, and it just looks terrible. The same if I were to scale it vertically. It just does not look correct. What the Slice Scale filter lets us do is scale only a portion of it so that we don't disturb the curvature or the roundness of the bubble and we don't adjust the tail at all. The way we use it is we go to the inspector and turn on Edit Slices just to adjust its position so that the area that's being sliced is perfectly flat here. It does not include any of the curve on these sides and it does not include the tail at all here. So when we change the scale of this group of these two objects, the only thing that will get stretched is this middle area that doesn't change. It's kind of like those build-in, build-out markers that we looked at earlier that stretch the time where everything was static, but now we're stretching in space instead of time. Now that we've done that, I'll uncheck Edit Slices, and I'll open up Scale, and now if I scale an X, look what happens. We can make it wider, but we aren't affecting the roundness of the bubble, and we aren't affecting the tail at all. I'll undo that and scale in Y. Now we can scale in Y. So now we can scale in X and Y without any kind of distortion. So what we want to now do is link up this scale of the Slice Scale filter to the scale of the text. So what we do is use this drop-down menu right here. Before, we're using that to publish parameters, but this time we're going to use it to add a parameter behavior. This is another type of behavior in motion. You can see there's many to choose from. There, most of them are, are fantastic. We're going to use the one called Link. And this also asks for a source. So I'm going to drag the text in to be the source to link to. And then for the parameter to link to, I'm going to choose Object Attributes Size All. And now the message bubble group automatically links its scale to the scale of the text. It's not quite what we want, but that's easy to adjust. What we'll do is go back to the slice scale, and we're going to use these expand parameters. So I'm going to move to the left a little bit, and the right, and the top, and the bottom to get a good starting point. Now, if I select that text, and I increase the font size, it all grows together, and it all shrinks together. Let's also use a font that's more appropriate for a text message. I'll just tap the letter H for Helvetica, and select that, and start with a smaller font size. So now that we have a message bubble that automatically aligns to and resizes to fit any text that goes in it, Let's animate that on the screen as well. I'm going to rename this group text. And then I'll close that and close the message bubble. I'm going to select them both. And then I'm going to use the group command to put them both in a group. Then I'm going to right click in the canvas and choose the anchor point tool to move the anchor point of this whole group down to this little tail here and then press Shift S to get back to the regular selection tool. You can also select the tools right here. I want to animate the scale of this whole thing to kind of pop on the screen, so I'm going to go to the Properties Inspector, and for Scale, I'm going to use another parameter behavior. This time, the one called Overshoot. I'll trim it so it's very short by tapping O. I'll set the Start value to minus 100, 
So it'll start with no scale at all. And when I play that back, everything pops on the screen and it has a nice little bounce to it. And you can adjust that, but I'll leave it as it is for now. Great. Now, if we don't want that animation to change in speed, what we can do is add a marker. So I'm going to press Shift M to add a marker, double click on it, and choose a built-in optional marker. I'll also get rid of this range here. You can either drag that over or you can press Option X to reset the range to the whole project. So now if the title is trimmed in Final Cut, the animation speed won't change. Let's also publish a few parameters so that the Final Cut user can adjust them. So for example, we could publish this rectangle shape color by going to Style and publishing the fill color directly. But that would only change the color of the rectangle and not the tail. You could publish the tail separately, but then you'd have two published parameters and it creates more work. So let's make it easier for the Final Cut Pro user by linking the color of this to the color of the rectangle. So I'll add a, another link behavior. And I'll drag the rectangle in the well, and it automatically knows to use the color. So now whatever color is applied to the rectangle will also be applied to the tail. So now we can publish the rectangle color. Let's also publish the roundness of that rectangle. If I go to the project, there are our published parameters, the build-in marker, the fill color. Notice if I change it that both the rectangle and the tail change color and the roundness, and we can test those out. We don't need to publish any text parameters because text parameters are always available in Final Cut Pro. So let's save it and check it out in Final Cut. So here in Final Cut, in our Titles browser, there's our My Message bubble. I've added it down to the timeline, and we can see it animates on. If we double click on it, we can change the text. And I've also included in the Publish Parameters the Expand Parameters, because sometimes if you add more lines, you may need to do a little bit of adjustment, and this allows you to adjust it in any way that you want. You can also, when you double click on it, adjust these margins if you want the bubble to be uh, not as wide or to be wider, so it's very flexible. And then if I hit Escape, I can drag this anywhere I want, and of course, I can uh, track it to anything uh, in the scene using the Object Tracker. And Publish Parameters, you could also, for instance, create a copy. I'll Option Drag for a copy for another version. And this version could be over here, and we could change this to a different color, uh, perhaps a green for a response. And you could add a rig to put the tail on the other side. So you can keep taking this further and further in order to develop your own sort of animated title look. So I hope that gives you some idea of where you can go with the titling, with a simple kind of title and using these different types of published parameters and behaviors and filters in motion. I know it's an overused metaphor, but we really have just scratched the surface of what you can do in motion. From creating simple and flexible title animations, lower thirds with drop zones, to rigged titles with 3D objects that you can change in Final Cut Pro by publishing the widget, or doing the same with the transition, to animating text around an object, animating shapes, creating a write-on effect with paint strokes, or by using a write-on behavior and animating a writing instrument with a motion path behavior, tracking video to a screen with a tracking behavior, adding keyed footage to a scene with the key filter, and tracking glasses made from a shape to the talent with another behavior, creating animation with behaviors like aligned emotion, oscillate, a tractor and point at, animating a rocket with wriggle and throw behaviors, or a mouse with a motion path behavior and the cat's eyes with a point at behavior, a trapeze artist with an oscillate behavior, or this hammer with the oscillate behavior set to half range, or even animate just about anything with the audio parameter behavior. The overshoot behavior makes these darts wiggle when they hit the board. 
The set speed behavior creates a speed ramping effect on this video. The repel behavior makes these replicated dots move away from the boat. The link behavior connects this thermostat to the dial. And multiple behaviors animate these cards to land on the table. Particle emitters are great. I modified this fog preset and then tracked it to this empty coffee cup in Final Cut Pro. Here, I use an emitter with an image of a leaf and a couple of behaviors. This emitter is animated with an oscillate behavior. This one with a random motion behavior. And these two with a moving attractor behavior. Here, an emitter is combined with gravity, repel, and edge collision behaviors. Smoke and flame emitter presets are great for rocket animations. So is this cartoon smoke. And you can even animate playing cards with an emitter. Replicators create copies of objects and are great for a blinking star field, creating flowing fabric light patterns, cool animated backgrounds, objects to mask transitions, or even copies of cars animated along a motion path. You can break apart photos, spread the layers out in 3D space, and animate a camera across or through them. Even add 3D text to the scene and push a camera right through it. Lights can cast reflections and shadows, and it's easy to animate a camera with framing and sweep behaviors to fly precisely from place to place. The focus behavior lets you create a rack focus effect, and lights can be colored and animated. 3D text can cast reflections and shadows on surfaces and can be placed in environments created with photos. It can be combined with other 3D objects and can use 3D text to create objects like these rings or even these gears animated with link behaviors or this 2D logo turned into 3D text and animated with text behaviors. 3D objects can be animated in motion. They can pass behind and in front of other 3D objects and can be added to 3D scenes created with photographs. Here, I've animated a camera to fly through a 3D object created with photogrammetry and imported into motion. 3D objects can be replicated, for example, to create this asteroid field. And you can even make particle emitters out of them, like these turtles. Did you know that all of our Final Cut Pro plugins, both those distributed on the FX Factory platform and our Ripple Live plugins, were made with motion? Like our free 3D animations or 3D styles with over 200 material presets. Or 3D drops for applying your own custom material. 3D scenes with animated 3D text interacting in environments. Callouts. Titlemations. Tools complete with guides and grids, an object remover, trackable blur, vertical video fixer, and credit roll with drop zones, RT messages for text messages, RT paths for animated lines, RT shortcuts to show keyboard shortcuts, RT time warps, and ripple whips for cool transitions. And we have all the training you need. Whether you're just getting started, want to animate photos or 3D objects, learn to rig and publish for Final Cut, create 3D titles, animate with behaviors, work with 3D cameras, animate shapes, work with replicators or particle emitters, and much more, all at rippletraining.com. Well, if you made it this far, hopefully that means you found something useful in here. Please leave us a comment below. We'd love to know your thoughts. Again, this is Mark from Ripple Training, and I hope to see you again soon.